written on the land echo through the red clay hills where the scent of long leaf float and pine reach up on past that georgia line stroll through tallahassee town or southern appalachia bound take the local roads and journey down the roads we call our home take the local roads and journey down the roads we call our home Welcome to Local Roots. I'm Suzanne Smith with WFSU Public Media. And today I'm standing at the edge of this wildflower area in Innovation Park in Tallahassee. Not to talk about these very tall flowers, but to talk about the pollinators that make them happen, specifically bees. Bees are an animal that elicit a variety of responses. For some, it's a love of the pollination they provide for the crops we eat or of the honey they make. For others, it's a fear of being stung. And while many of us think of the European honeybee when we think of bees, there are actually hundreds of native species in the Florida area. WFSU's Rob Diaz de Viegas talked with University of Florida entomologist Dr. Rachel Mallinger to learn more about these bees. We think there's about 320, 325 uh, species, and that includes some that are not native. The honeybee is not native, for example. So of those 310 to 315 species, there's a huge variety in size and color. Some of them are not much larger than a large ant. Others like the carpenter bees, those are larger than bumblebees, larger than honeybees. At least the large carpenter bees are. For most people, if they're just looking in their yard, bumblebees are pretty common, more so in the northern half of Florida. And those are the really hairy round ones. They're like little furry round balls. Carpenter bees are also common. Those look a bit like bumblebees, but they're uh, typically larger and a little less hairy, a little more metallic. And then there's one particular sweat bee that is really common, Polyctus poiei. Poies furrow bee is the common name. And it's a little smaller than a honeybee, uh, black and white striped, that one's real common. There's a common longhorned bee, which is in the genus Melisodes, that's black but has white hairy legs, so a really distinct color pattern. to our native plants and ecosystems, but they also pollinate tomatoes and other food crops. All we have to do is invite them into our yard. WFSU's Rob Diaz de Viegas talked with some local plant experts about what we need to invite those bees into our yards. It starts with providing them some space to raise their young. If you want to promote native bees, habitat is the most important, right? Providing them a place to live. The way we do that is we provide them with food, water, and shelter. Bees need flowers and also nesting habitat. So those are, those are the two things that you can provide. The first step for creating a bee-friendly yard is observation. And so observing in natural areas like this one, what it looks like, what is part of the ecosystem. More natural looking landscapes for me offer an enjoyment of life. I get to see all these little things and in this connected circle of life. We're talking bee habitat. We'll get to flowers in part two of this segment, but before bees can visit your flowers, they need places to nest and spend the winter. We start in the Munson Sandhills. So when we are talking about creating a habitat for bees and other pollinators in our yards, the first step is observing. So walking into your yard and in your neighborhood and seeing what type of habitat you already live in. 
because we're trying to recreate and reestablish the environment and ecosystems that our human disturbance has disturbed, you know? These are the sand hills in the winter. Bees come from places like this. And when we mimic how natural areas help bees in the winter, we see more bees in the spring. It's important to remember that a lot of our native bees, when you see them, it's a short little part of their life cycle usually where they're out and about. The rest of the time they're spending in the ground. In terms of providing nesting resources, most bees nest below ground. So thinking about having ground that's accessible and that's not heavily disturbed is good for those ground nesting bees. Leaving a little space where you're not going to be tilling, uh, not going to be mowing often, not going to be walking through often. You want to have some exposed soil in areas that have some sunlight and some exposed soil in some shade. This can occur around your flowers as well. Having areas of your yard that don't have a cloth or plastic barrier or, or really thick a barrier of mulch. You can still use pine straw like this as mulch and the insects can still move the pine straw and use utilize the area. Pine straw is probably your best choice for mulch in your home garden because it's um, sustainable, it is um, local and um, a renewable resource and it's a part of the natural ecosystems here. So you're recreating the natural ecosystem. Also, leaving the leaves, just leave the leaves. It's considered brown gold, and you just want a light leaf litter on top of your beds. It also creates a lot of organic matter for the soil and makes, um, really enriches your soil. It's not just leaves and pine needles. It's a hard idea for a lot of us to embrace, but bees need dead plant material in your yard branches and dead stems like like this one Th those are critical for nesting habitat for bees and for overwintering for bees what i like to do is leave your dead stalks through the winter typically cut them back late february early march when the new growth is just starting to emerge our native bees will use the pithy stems from plants like elderberry pokeweed even Monarda, they tend to nest in those stems. At home, as in the forest, some bee species also nest in decaying wood. This is our brush pile. It is built upon with twigs and branches of all different sizes and shapes. This is a magical spot for native bees and other invertebrates. Everything from skinks to mice to birds, they'll come through. The twigs and branches offer homes for bees, solitary tunnel nesting bees. It also offers some exposed soil at the bottom for other uh, ground nesting bees. Some folks may wonder, you know, how can you incorporate dead stuff into a landscape with it still looking somewhat attractive. And so what we do here is we use actually a lot of these sticks to line our paths. You can see our little path meanders through our little shade garden here. And we just use the branches that fall to line it along the way. And it's a great way to feed the microbes in the soil with this decaying wood matter. Leaving any kind of snag if you can is incredible for wildlife. One of the most important trees in the forest is a dead tree. And so again, providing dead material in your landscape in a kind of attractive kind of way is a really good way to bring in native bees, other insects, to try the best you can to make your landscape a living ecosystem. You won't likely see your bees over the winter months, but if you leave some bare patches of ground, leaves, flower stalks, and dead wood, you're much more likely to see them in the spring and summer. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas. Those two stories we just showed you are part of a special project we're working on that's tied into an upcoming documentary by PBS Nature called My Garden of a Thousand Bees. It airs on October 20th at 8 p.m. Eastern. Here's a preview. In the spring of 2020, as the country goes into lockdown, outside, the garden is coming alive. 
As a wildlife filmmaker, I knew there were revelations here. Discovering the secret life of bees took me on a journey I was not expecting. The broadcast of My Garden of a Thousand Bees kicks off months of WFSU stories and events focusing on creating a habitat for the native species of bees in our area. Learn more at wfsu.org slash beegarden. As we mentioned before, the European honeybee is not native to this area, but there is a rare colony of American bee that's found locally. WFSU's Rob Diaz de Villegas brought us this story first back in 2019 and shows us what it takes to raise a rare species of bee. I can't give you the date that I became interested. When I was a kid, I was the kid out, you know, on the clover plants, catching the bees, watching them, even marking them when I was five, six years of age. So it just progressed from there. I was doing some holiday work. I was carrying shingle to the roof for my uncle. He was a, a carpenter. The owner of the house is a bee farmer and asked if I want to help him during those down period. And I said, yes. Going into the hives a couple of times and, you know, seeing how the bees work, everything gets so fascinating. Lee and Worrell have been working together to breed strong and productive honeybees. Lee's yard is a refuge for these non-native pollinators, as well as native bees, wasps, and butterflies. Today, we meet a new arrival here. Bombus pensilvinica. They are native to the United States. When you see bumblebees in your yard, they're more likely the common eastern bumblebee. They are endangered and uh, the habitats are being destroyed based upon urbanization and agriculture, extensive agriculture production. I'm somewhat pleased um, having learned, you know, exactly what they are, that they're a, a bee that's at risk uh, to be able to provide a sanctuary where they can, you know, not just live but thrive. The bumblebees had colonized a gourd birdhouse similar to these purple martin gourds at Lake Alberta. But not all native bees form colonies. Apart from the only bee which is um, not native, most of our local bees that are found here, they are somewhat solitary. Some of them would somewhat um, have a plastic relationship where they would start out solitary and uh, where they would find one queen go and establish her nest and after laying those eggs will emerge, those set of workers, and then those workers will nurse other brood, and then it will go into like a youth social kind of setting. So we'd have cooperative brood care and overlapping generation. Providing a home for native bees helps preserve our local biodiversity. By raising non-native honeybees, they're trying to help an economically important agricultural animal. All right, this is a drone right here. So there's tree cast in the hive. You have the queen, the workers, and the drone. So the drone is the male bee, and the drone don't sting. There's the uncapped larva if you wanted to, to see how they lay in there. Move out of the way. Breeding a bee is simple, in my opinion, right? Um, once you've mastered the art of it, uh, it's not really difficult. But breeding a bee that is viable is something that's totally different. So we're looking for a bee that's resilient. We're looking for a bee that's hygienic. You know, what's a clean bee? It's a bee that cares for its, its colony and cares for the hive in which it's in. Now my research is trying to find ways how we can uh, improve the health of honey bee. The collapse is it's a combination of issues. It's a combination of management. It's a combination of pests. It's a combination of improper pesticide use, monocropping. The you know, agricultural practice and, as I said, urbanization where habitats are being destroyed. One pest we saw today was the small hive beetle. They lay their eggs in honey stores where their larvae will hatch. And they would you know, pass their waste and they would cause that stored honey to become acidic and, uh, and moisture level would increase and it would cause the bees to just abscond and leave the hive. While Lee and Worrell manage their hives to best protect their bees, they're also looking to breed a bee that can survive on its own. We manage the colonies. We know they're going to make it to the winter because if we see that, that, that you know, they're starting to, to, to run a little bit shy on their stores, we'll supplement. But a bee in the wild doesn't do that, right? That colony would collapse. So we're looking to build a bee 
um, that is that is capable of, of overwintering in and of itself. So the genetics that, that we're producing here will be injected into the environment around us. Both honeybees and our native pollinators need habitat to survive. That habitat could be right in your yard. About, I'd say about three quarters of an acre we converted into a natural pollinator habitat, if you will. While this segment is focused on bees, it's not just the bees that we're trying to support here. So the, the water feature, at first it was an aesthetic thing, but we noticed there was a lot of mosquito larvae in it, right? And so mosquito larvae led me to put in some fish into it, and the fish were there. And then we noticed the bees were starting to come over, so I put some lily pads into it. And so it's grown now. So if persons put in more native plants in their yard, that can be a, a good habitat. A uh, refuge era for uh, many, many beneficial insects. You'll find a lot of different solitary native pollinators. You'll find the bumblebee, you'll find the honeybee, you'll find other insects also that are feeding on them. So it's like a complete ecosystem. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Viegas. Obviously, bees are not the only pollinators out there. In fact, scientists invite the public every year to help them learn more about the ones in our area. It's through the Great Georgia Pollinator Census. The first one took place in 2019, and WFSU's Rob Diaz de Viegas was there in Thomasville when it happened. There are many, many species of native bees and wasps and flies. The house fly is only one of hundreds. Honeybees only one of hundreds. And wasps too, there's hundreds of species of wasps. If you have a pollinator garden or you look carefully at any blooming plant, you'll see there are all kinds of insects buzzing around them. We are at the Cherokee Lake Pollinator Garden in Thomasville. Here, citizen scientists are helping to paint a picture of pollinator health in the state of Georgia. This is the first ever Georgia pollinator census. It's called the Great Georgia Pollinator Census, and it was started by the University of Georgia, and people are counting pollinators all over the state for science. So what are you, what are you guys like marking down specifically when you see each plant? Um, just like how many butterflies we see, uh, mm -hmm. whatever sort of insects or animals that we see crawling around the tree or making a habitat out of the plant, then that's usually what we uh, record. Mm -hmm. Cool. And so far we've seen a lot of butterfly crystallis, a lot of caterpillars. Lots of ants. Mm -hmm. Stink being out here today, we've seen some really cool praying mantis. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Lots of action with them. It's really amazing how little so many people know about anything in nature. So citizen science gets people out in nature. So for this census today, people have learned about pollinators and learned about the groups of pollinators. Pollinators include butterflies and moths but also carpenter bees, bumblebees, honeybees, small bees, wasps, flies, and other insects like beetles. Beetles are a pretty common pollinator. Pollinators need more than just flowers. Each butterfly can only lay its eggs on specific plants. Probably the one that people know the most is monarchs. Monarchs uh, will not lay their eggs on any plants except milkweeds. There is nothing as pretty as a monarch chrysalis. Oh, it's just gorgeous. It has golden, shiny, metallic looking dots across the top of it. It is so beautiful. Some of the host plants are non-native. For instance, the giant swallowtail, which is our largest butterfly, uh, its native host plant is a hop tree. This one's different. But they also can use any kind of citrus plant. And so if you have a lime or an orange or satsuma or anything like that, and you see a caterpillar on it that looks like bird poop, that's the giant swallowtail caterpillar. Really beautiful butterfly. Right here, this vine, you see this vine with these big leaves right here? That's a passion vine, and that's their fruit. And it's, it's edible. And have y'all ever heard of maypops? 
down here in the south, um, kids kids would take the balls and hit them, hit each other with them, and they would pop. This is the larval food of the Gulf fritillary butterfly. Fan petals are a weed that will grow easily in your yard, and they host checkered skipper butterflies. I saw this one appearing to lay an egg on a flower bud in my yard. Then, during the pollinator census, I saw this happen on a fan petal. Some people may get upset when they, they see their caterpillars getting eaten, but that's all part of the web of life. Another thing that you'll see when you start a, a pollinator garden is the predator. I'm 70 years old, and um, I won't be around a whole lot longer, but uh, we need so much for younger generations to get involved with these kinds of things. But I want to encourage everybody to plant natives and to get involved with any kind of nature activity you can, like Audubon and Florida Trails and Florida Native Plant Society, and uh, for Georgians, Georgia Native Plant Society, Georgia Botanical Society. For WFSU, I'm Rob Diaz de Villegas. You can learn more about the pollinators in our area as well as the other creatures of the North Florida, South Georgia area by heading to our ecology blog. That blog is just one of the ways you can learn more about the local roots of our community. And while it often focuses on the literal roots growing out of the ground and the other ecology topics of our community, we also in this program focus on arts, culture, people, and history. Here's a preview of what's coming soon and ways you can discover more about local roots. Coming up on WFSU Public Media's Local Roots. What was important to me is to let women age. It is so oftentimes in film and in photography, uh, we see women, we say they look great because they look like they're 35 when they're 60 years old. We explore the story behind the stories of a new art exhibit featuring local women of our community. Join us October 21st at 8 p.m. Eastern on WFSU Public Media. That's it for this episode of Local Roots. I'm Suzanne Smith. Remember, you can see the PBS Nature documentary, My Garden of a Thousand Bees, October 20th at 8 p.m. Eastern, right here on WFSU Public Media. Plus, you can see all the stories in this episode on our website, wfsu.org slash local roots. And while you're there, go ahead and follow us on Facebook and Instagram. Plus, one more thing you can do while you're online, sign up for our community calendar newsletter. Delivered weekly to your email, it's a great way to stay on top of events happening in person and in the virtual world. For everyone at WFSU Public Media, thanks for watching. Have a great week. Magnolia trees greet the southern breeze in the land where rivers wind. Seeds that spring up from the past leave us treasures yet to find. Where our children play along the land our fathers build with honest hands. Take a moment now, look around the paradise we have found. Take a look.